Hello, my name is Edward Simpson. I'm rising 95 and during the Second World War from 1942 to 1945, I was a cryptanalyst at Bletchley Park. I had a, a very far-sighted headmaster who was a decorated soldier from the First World War. And I remember very clearly he had my parents and me in in about July when we'd had the results and mine were quite good. And he said, now, clearly there is a war coming. It would be a waste of Edward to go into the infantry and get shot up. Uh, I will fix it that he goes to university a year early and study mathematics and science and then he can be some use to the war effort. It wasn't essential to understand Italian, and I never went on a course to learn Italian. And remember also that we're not talking about literature here. We're talking about a very stereotyped form of naval signal. So, you know, you're not uh, talking about romance or cherry blossom or anything like that. I mean, it is things like HMS Dorchester <laughs> left Singapore 11.03 yesterday. <laughs> and it's, it's very stereotyped. And you very quickly picked up enough of the language. As a cryptanalyst, uh, our job ended at the point where we had produced as best we could uh, the, the message in Italian. And then it went to a completely separate set of translators who turned it into English. And then, in turn, that went on to the intelligence people who would take the messages and say, what is there here that's useful? But what we called a crib was a situation where you either know, or if you don't know, you can make a very sensible guess as to what clear text actually underlies the enciphered message that you have in front of you. Because if there's a sporting chance that those words are appearing, then you can, it's hard to describe this without pencil and paper, but working backwards and forwards and saying, well, if these words are going to occur, are they here or are they four or five groups later. Each speculation that you do has consequences. You follow those consequences until either, whoopee, it worked, or bother, it hasn't worked, go back to the beginning and put the crib in a different position and do the whole thing again. Then in uh, early 1943, Italy surrendered, so it was no surprise that I found myself transferred into the Japanese side. What was a surprise was, because I was still pretty young, was that I was asked to create and then take charge of a section that hadn't previously existed to work on the Japanese cipher, Kodan cipher, which was the American Swiss and JN-25. As the battle moved across the Pacific Islands, there were quite a surprising number of what the jargon called pinches, that the Allied troops would go ashore on the Pacific Island and overwhelm the little Japanese garrison fairly quickly, and before the Japanese sometimes had time to burn their cipher documents. And so the cipher documents could actually be seized so uh, sometimes what appeared an impossible impasse was broken open overnight because uh, there had been a pinch. People always ask me if I knew Alan Turing and uh, the truthful answer would be no. But the literal answer is, well, yes, I did bump up against him because uh, there was an obligation 
on all the fit young men at Bletchley Park to serve in the Home Guard. When we were on parade, we were in uniform and we were taught how to use First World War rifles. But to imagine that we could have uh, overpowered a group of 30 German parachutists is, I think, <laughs> a bit fanciful. Now, uh, you might also have thought that where there were people of absolute top importance as cryptanalysts, like Alan Turing, the people in charge would have said, well, in this awful eventuality of a German parachute drop, the first thing we must do is to get the Alan Turings and the Leslie Oxalls and all the really important people and put them into a safe place and lock them. And then that would have kept them safe. But whatever the thinking, they didn't. We were all expecting to be there for months and months and months. Then, of course, there were the two atomic bombs in quick succession, and uh, the Japanese war was over. There was no way that we could speak about it. Uh, sitting at dinner in College Hall, you could discern very, very different groups of people. There were, of course, undergraduates, because university education went on, notwithstanding the war. And then there were what the jargon at the time called the returning warriors, not old men, but men who were old in experience, and they were swapping tales. Uh, oh yes, I was in the Burmese jungle, and so forth and so forth. And then there was me and a couple of others, who were clearly not undergraduates, but couldn't join in the conversation and say, well, I was in Germany, or I was at Monte Cassino, or whatever. <laughs> and when people would say, well, what did you do in the war? We would just mumble and uh, change the subject. It was a recurrent thought all the time that I was at Bletchley Park uh, that my contemporaries, they were doing the most horrific things. They were flying bombers over Germany, or they were in submarines in the Atlantic, or they were fighting in the Burmese jungle and getting killed. And I mean, here was I sitting in a comfortable office job, uh, two or three meals a day, good night's sleep. Now, I, I didn't feel guilty about it because I knew that I was doing what the people who knew had decided that that was the best thing for me to do from the country. So I didn't feel guilty, but I did feel, uh, if this doesn't you know, sound too grand, I did feel an absolute compulsion for the sake of those of my colleagues who were doing these other tough things that I, I and every young man there will have felt the same. I really had to do my damnedest to do the best job I could. <laughs>